a very, very high false positive rate. If you loosen up your standards and say, well, anything that's stylistic, a tool like Lint will actually have very few false positives. But again, everybody is, is in a different place, but most people tend to be in somewhere in the middle. They're interested in the coding flaws. Yes, what's going wrong in the code? But they want to make sure that the coding flaws have real runtime impact. And so static tools have tend to err uh, until very recently. They've tended to err on the side of, well, I'm just going to warn about everything. You know, kind of like the compiler warnings. Or if we just turn on everything, then, you know, you can't argue that I'm incorrect in telling you that this particular style is incorrect. But that's not so useful. So that's one thing to watch out for in the static tools. The next thing, and this is somewhat related to the false positive, static tools will often have incomplete information about the code. Namely, you might analyze one part of the uh, one one file or, or a couple of functions, but that doesn't necessarily give you the whole picture of what's going on with the entire system. And again, until recently, there wasn't really a good answer to this. Without the with, with incomplete information about the the whole code, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have assumptions that are incorrect about what's going on in the code. If you see a function call as a static analysis tool, if you see a function call and you don't know what that function does, you have to guess, in essence. And you can guess conservatively, um, meaning you could assume the worst, and, and that might lead to false positives if you're wrong. Or you could assume you know, the best and that it's working correctly, and that might lead to false negatives, lead to places where the, there is a bug in the code, but you didn't find it. Uh, and so incomplete information about the code is can be a, a real killer for a static tool. Now, like I mentioned, that's traditionally been a problem. Uh, the, the solution that we provide that I'll talk about a little bit later does get over some of those hurdles. But um, I would say that's rather state of the art. The last con to talk about um, the, the static tools is, is really what it is learning about the code as it's analyzing it. You can write a static analysis tool that is essentially grep. Right? Uh, for example, some people, especially people with security-focused uh, minds and security audit minds, they might call out every uh, stir copy in your code as a bug. You know, stir copy is dangerous. Stir copy is something you shouldn't use. And as such, I don't want to see any stir copies in this particular code base. Well, there's a great tool for a static analysis tool for, for finding those, and it's called grep. Right? You can grep through the code. You can find every single one of them. But those aren't it won't help you in terms of understanding which of the third copies are actually incorrect. Some of them may be fine. The, the buffers might be both null terminated and within the right bounds, and there's no possibility for overflow. Um, but a grep won't tell you that because it doesn't actually understand what's going on. And so the, because of that, there's a wide range of tools that are available, and some of them are very superficial if they don't understand exactly how the source code is built. Um, or how the software is built from the source code. If it's not actually doing the same kind of things as a compiler would do, if it doesn't understand how the pieces are linked together to form an executable, well, then it, the results are going to be superficial. That means false positives. That means false negatives. Um, and it also just means you're probably not going to be able to do much with the results. They're not going to be actionable. The analysis isn't going to be able to tell you why it thinks something is bad if it's based on these heuristics. So those are, can, can be some of the cons on the, on the static analysis side. So if you wanted to use them, how would you go about uh, using these, these products or these technologies? Well, I, you know, obviously it call up people or download folks, and we'll talk about a couple of, of particular solutions uh, after this slide. But I just wanted to give you a, a few questions to think about in terms of if you have a dynamic tool vendor or open source project you're looking at it using or a static tool vendor or open source project that you're looking at. And you really want to find out if it's doing what it should do. Here are some questions to think about. On the dynamic side, how does it instrument the code? You know, what exactly is it instrumenting? And as a result, you'll get a sense for what type of performance hit does it impose. Some can be somewhat lightweight, but they're not going to be able to keep track with many things. Some can be a lot more voluminous in terms of what it's keeping track of. And um, those things, you know, understanding what it's instrumenting in your code um, will help you really understand what its capabilities are in terms of the types of defects that it can uncover for you and uh, whether or not you're going to be hit with any of these timing constraints that I mentioned before. And the, the last question to really ask of those, those kind of tools is, does it really find the problems that are killing you now? Uh, I see mostly uh, 
the dynamic tools like Purify and Valgrind, I see them mostly being used as, as band-aids, as, you know, we've noticed this bug has hit, and now we're going to uh, apply this tool to, to really weed out what, what's going on. Now, depending on the performance, you may get it to the point where it is running regularly in your, um, in your test suite, and you can be a little bit more proactive. Um, but if it's not looking for things that are actually going to cause you problems today, uh, then, then maybe you know it's, it's not exactly hitting the mark for you because I think these tools are much more in the I've got a symptom and now I need to know what's going wrong. On the static tools side, things you want to look for, and again the philosophy is a little different. I think with static tools, and that they are more proactive about quality and and defect detection because you are in essence you're saying I I don't necessarily know what the runtime impact is going to be of all the issues that a static tool finds, but you still want to evaluate whether or not it's a good static analysis tool or if it's, um, if it's not going to provide a lot of value and you just end up as shelfware. So a couple of questions to think about. What does it really, what does it do to really understand your, not only your code but your build system? Because the more accurate picture it can build of your software, the more successful a static analysis tool can be in analyzing your code. You want something that's analyzing the closest representation of a set of source files to the eventual executable as possible. And what has that information? Well, your build system does. Your build system you know, compiles all the code, links all the code together. And so you need a software analysis tool or a static analysis tool that can understand that. And then similarly on the code side, how does it understand the code? Is it is it correct? Or is it a compiler? You know, a compiler keeps track of everything that's necessary to generate an executable. So you want a static tool that really is a compiler. It's authentically compiling your code the exact same way that your native compiler would. Because that's how you get analysis that's, that's correct and that's useful. One of the symptoms that you can observe, uh, whether or not they're doing the right things and understanding the build and understanding the code, is what is the resulting false positive rate? Uh, you know, if if you have superficial techniques, chances are that it's going to manifest itself by not being able to report bugs with high fidelity. If you got a lot of false positives, that means you're not doing the right thing on the front end to really understand what's going on. And it also means that uh, the tool might not end up being used. Developers hate wasting their time, right? And I'm sure if you're a developer, you know exactly what I'm talking about in that when I say if you have a tool that reports 10 defects and the first nine of those are bogus, you're going to ignore the 10th one, even if it's the thing that's going to keep you from spending all night debugging your code, because you don't trust the technology. So a high false positive rate is a sure sign of, of, of getting the shelfware. So watch out for that. Um, and then the, the last question to ask of a static analysis tool is, is, can you really understand the results that it reports? Uh, do you really... Um, is the analysis sound enough so that when it produces a defect for you, you can actually understand what it's talking about and you understand why it thinks it's a problem? Going back to the stir copy example, if you had grep, uh, it wouldn't give you any insight into why it thought any given stir copy was an issue. And that doesn't help you to make your code better. It just gives you some potential places to go and do further digging. That may have its merit, but it depends on how much time you have to do that kind of digging. So really understand how the results are reported and what you can do to diagnose the results that come out of these kind of tools. Because they are analyzing source code, so they should be able to tell you an awful lot about, this, about your source code. So to wrap up, I want to just talk and introduce you to a few of, of these kind of tools that you might get to go. And, and for each category, there's just two tools that I wanted to, to highlight, one open source, one commercial. So that if you wanted to go and start downloading things right now, you could do that. Uh, the first is Dalgrind. And Valgrind was implemented by a guy named uh, Julian Seward. And it was originally designed as a kind of free memory debugging tool for Linux on x86. But now it's, it's evolved a little bit beyond that. It's, uh, in essence, a, a just-in-time virtual machine. And it's a framework for implementing other checks on top of it. And so it translates your binaries as they're running. It translates your binaries into a, a simpler form, an intermediate representation that's, that's processor neutral. And then you can plug modules on top of that to um, walk through that you know, internal representation and determine things about what's going on. The most common one I think out there is memcheck, 
the most common module on top of Valgrind is memcheck, and, and that's inserting extra instrumentation code around all the instructions that keep track of um, memory reads and writes and where you're writing to memory. And, and 